Well, I think I greeted most all of you, but good morning again anyway. Good morning. Um, when Aaron was speaking earlier, uh, he was uh, inviting the uh, Holy Spirit to come into the room. And as I was sitting back there, all of a sudden I felt this cool wind, wow. and it felt like it blew my hair. Uh, so I, don't know. Yeah. I think he is here. Yeah. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am and will be with them. Hallelujah. Praise him for that. I want to talk to you a little bit this morning about death, about dying, about the end of the world. What I see in the scripture that gives us a bit of an understanding about these things. Death has been strong on my mind in the last week or so. On Monday we, it seems a lot longer to me, but on Monday we buried Brother Dave. And yesterday we buried my father-in-law. So death has been a real part of our lives this week. Um, and it just brought me to the point where God, I felt like God was finally saying it's time to bring his message out. Some of this message I uh, know may bring disagreements, but I don't want it to really bring disagreements. If it brings um, thoughts perhaps leading in another direction, that's okay. And if it brings things that we can talk about, that's okay. But I really don't want it to bring disagreements. And just, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about my father-in-law's death, if I could. It was one of the most, um, I, don't, I don't know how many of you know, but my father-in-law was sick for uh, the last five or six years. And as time went on, he progressed and he became slightly uh, more unable to uh, care for himself. He was afflicted with dementia, afflicted with um, another disease in his legs, I forget the name of it. And for the past um, three, four months, he really couldn't get around at all. So he needed a lot of help. And for the last month, he couldn't help himself at all. The only thing that he could really do was reach out his hand, take a hold of the glass of water, and take a drink. He was able to do that, as far as I know, to his dying day. He often asked for a drink. He wanted a drink. Father-in-law was um, about a, uh, I used to go up there every morning. I would help him get up. I'd help him clean him. Uh, we would clean him. Uh, we would put his clothes on for the day. We would uh, lift him up, take him, and put him in a chair. And he would sit there most of the day. Uh, just seeming to be asleep. About a week or so ago, we realized that it was too much for Dad to even get out of bed, so we just left him in bed. We took care of him, we cleaned him, we fed him as much as we could. He didn't eat much, he didn't drink much. And uh, we knew that the end was near. So I got a phone call Wednesday morning about 1.30. And instantly I knew what the phone call was about. But I still wasn't quite ready for it. <laughs> there was a part of me that didn't want to pick up the phone. But I did, and it was Mom. And she said, Dad went home. And what she said was the truth. Dad went home. Two weeks ago, I don't know if I could have said that. But God is so gracious. Jesus is just so wonderful in our lives. And if we are willing to accept Jesus for who he is, and if we are willing to step out, it's amazing what God can do in our lives and other people's lives. I used to talk to Dad about Jesus, talk to him about his sins, ask him if he felt that they were forgiven. I never really got good answers. I wasn't even sure if he knew what I was talking about. But I kept on. Tuesday morning, mother-in-law wanted to go to a wedding. 
And so my wife and I and Lillian went up to be with Dad. <coughs> in James, we can read where it says in James 5, where it says that if someone is sick, the elders of the church should come, anoint him, and pray over him. And it says that when that happens, that his sins will be forgiven. And so I, you got to remember, Mom's Amish, totally Amish. I asked her that morning, Tuesday morning, I asked her if uh, anybody was out to anoint him and pray over him. And she said, no. And I explained to her what the Bible says about praying for people like Dad, anointing him, and that he can forgive his sins. And Mom mentioned, well, I did talk to him about his sins. I did remind him to ask for forgiveness. And I asked her if she feels that's enough. She didn't answer. So I asked her again if she doesn't feel it would be a good idea to have her ministers come out, pray over Dad, and anoint him. And her answer stunned me. She said, why don't you do it? And I, I told her, yes, I would, I would do it. But at that time and point, I wasn't thinking straight. Somebody set me straight later on. But I still felt at that point that it was actually her minister's <coughs> responsibility to take care of this. And I still think it was their responsibility, but they didn't recognize their responsibility, so somebody else needed to step in. So I asked Mom again if she didn't want to ask the preachers when she goes to the wedding today, don't you just want to ask them to come out? And she thought a little bit, and she said, no, you just go ahead and do it. And so I agreed. After she left her... Uh, I asked some people to come, and I explained what was going on. And I told them how I felt, that I felt like it was the uh, ministers in the church that he was going to his responsibility to do this. And I was uh, soon given to understand that I'm thinking absolutely wrong, that nobody has more authority than I do that morning. And I agreed that, and I accepted that. She asked me. God gave me the uh, desire and I, I believe that I had the, uh, re the responsibility and the power. Right. A couple of brothers came up to help me. Praise God for that. It was a precious time. I want to tell you, it was an awesome time. We prayed for Dad. you got to remember, Dad couldn't talk much. His mind went hither and yonder, and, I don't, and he, uh, a lot of times... Didn't, he couldn't even give me a name. He could a month ago, but the last week or so, he couldn't remember who I was. He couldn't remember who his wife was. Anybody. So that morning, we prayed for him. And we anointed him. And one of the brothers, I'm, I'm not sure of the exact words that were spoken, but basically what came out was, if he is willing to surrender his life to Christ and put the, all of his sins under the cross, and he said yes, and I know that it was a heartfelt yes. I was around him long enough to know when he was saying something that he understood or when he was just responding. When he said, when he would say yes, it would be an astounding right out there, yes, you knew there was no doubt about it. When he wasn't sure what to answer, he would first close his eyes, and then he would say something. He totally understood what he was asking. He, he agreed um, that he would be willing to do this, give his life to Christ, put his sins under the cross. Another brother asked him a couple of questions, and he replied by yes again. You know what? I know that Dad is saved. Praise God. Amen. Hey, you know what? I'm really happy about that. <laughs> I was concerned. You know, here I am, taking care of this older guy. Not feeling good about what he's going to meet when he leaves. It all changed that morning. And the amazing thing is that less than 32 hours later, he was gone. He was out of here. And when I looked at that 
when I stood beside his bed that morning, early, and I looked at his body, I realized, you know what? And I was almost smiling, I believe. I realized that dad is no longer there. That body has nothing to do with dad. Dad is not in it. This is simply a shell. It's just a shell. And all that we need, uh, all that we can do with that shell is to take it out, uh, put it away, because it has absolutely no value whatsoever. And that's the case with us uh, when we pass away. Our body, we won't be in it. Where will we be? That depends entirely on whether we were willing to give our life to Christ or not, whether we were willing to understand who Jesus Christ really is, why he died, and that he died, and then he hung on the cross for our sins. If we're willing to understand these things, we will be with him forever. We will reign with him in glory. Hallelujah. But there's another side to it. If we don't get the opportunity to speak those words, if we don't get the opportunity to accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, I was studying these scriptures pertaining to death a lot yesterday, and I found one that made it very clear in my mind. I've had those moments when I thought, you know what, Jesus died for my sins, blah, 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 and he died for each one of them. You know what, I'm not sure, maybe, maybe is there really a hell? Would he actually send people to hell? There's a scripture in here that totally proves that yes, People do either go to heaven or they go to hell. And we can't get away from that. We really can't get away from that. And I am just so blessed that I know that Dad, whether he's in heaven now or whether he's sleeping until Jesus comes again, he's in Jesus' hands. And Jesus will be there for him. Jesus will be, he will be with Jesus forever and ever. I am convinced of this. So why am I telling this story? Well, because it... Uh, it means a lot to me. You got to remember that the Amish way of life doesn't embrace some of these things. People would uh, question you when you say that you're born again and that you know that you have eternal life. Dad isn't in that situation anymore. He's in Jesus' hand completely. And he has eternal life with Christ. I'm convinced of that. So what does the Bible say about death? Ecclesiastics 12, 7 tells us that the body turns to dust and the breath of life goes back to, uh, back to God. And that's what I was saying. Our body, after our spirit leaves, after we leave our body, the body has absolutely no value. We usually put it in a box and we dig a hole and then we put it in there. And we cover it up. Why? Because it has no value at that point. It is absolutely worthless. The body that he had resided in up until the death day. The body that we reside in up until the day that we die. The Bible does tell us that we will receive a new body. But this old one is, is uh, done for. It has no value anymore. Acts 2.29 says, men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of David, that he is both dead and buried. And verse 34 says that David did not ascend into the heavens. You know, there's a lot of question about when we die, do we immediately go to be with Jesus or do we immediately go and be a part of the devil's kingdom? There are people that believe that, that as soon as we die, we go immediately to our um, reward. There are also people that believe that uh, when we die in Christ, we would go to be with Christ immediately. But if we don't die in Christ, then we would sleep until Jesus comes, and then we would be uh, in the days of the judgment, and that's when we would receive our eternal damnation. There are also those that believe that everybody that dies sleeps, just sleeps until Jesus comes back again. It doesn't really matter. It really doesn't when you stop to think about it. 
What matters is that we're ready for that day, that we ourselves are ready for our death day. It's going to come. Unless Jesus comes first in the sky, which I hope he does, because I want to be here to see that. But you know what? I will be here to see it even if I'm dead, because the Bible tells me that even those who sleep, it says that the ones that are living will not precede those that are dead, those that are sleeping. So I'm believing that even if I passed on, that I will awake and I will see Jesus come in the air. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Come on. Isn't it wonderful to realize um, that we don't need to die in our sins? We can also read in uh, John 11. I'd like to go there, actually. So uh, I'm just saying, you know, what happens when we die? Exactly what does happen? I'm not sure that I can answer that question. Will we die and, and immediately be with Jesus? Or will we just be sleeping? There are verses in the Bible that take it either way. There are about 50 some places in, I think, just in the New Testament where it talks about sleep after death. There are not that many that talk about uh, immediately going to be with Jesus. I know that Paul talked about those things. I know that he uh, said that he wishes that he could die because to die is gain. That he would rather be with Jesus than be on the earth. I think when he said those things, he was chained up, maybe in his own house with the soldiers around him. And I believe he was just tired of life. He just wanted to get out of here. So Paul spoke about that different times, but he also spoke uh, in the other direction as to the fact that when we die, we just sleep. So what I'm saying is, don't let it be a stumbling block. Regardless of how you think, doesn't matter. I just keep thinking that way. Surely wouldn't want arguments and stuff based on this subject. And I personally can tell you that I don't know for sure which way it's going to be. And I can personally tell you that I really don't care. But I know that I'm going to die. I know that. And I know that you're going to die, each and every one of you, unless Jesus comes first. So be ready. Be ready for that day. Be ready like Dad was. Just be ready for when your name is called, when the angels come for you. I was so wishing I could be there when Dad died. You know, I agree to love this man. I agree to just love him with all my heart. I kept telling him that I love him, which is something that he probably didn't hear much of. We would sing songs with him, and he would try to help <coughs> I don't know, did we sing a song with him that morning? Yeah, we did. We sang, Jesus Loves Me. And if I remember right, his lips were moving a little bit, but there was no words came out. So he was by himself. I mean, he was, he was understanding what was going on at that point. He was understanding what was going on that morning. I am totally convinced that God gave him the grace to understand what was going on and that he accepted what God had for him. I know that that happened. So John 11, uh, starting around verse 32. This was about Lazarus. Lazarus was a good friend of Jesus. Lazarus was uh, a brother to Martha. And they all loved Lazarus a whole bunch. That Lazarus died one day. So starting in verse 32. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and he was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. What did Jesus do then? He wept. He wept. He wept because Lazarus was dead. Why? Why did he weep because Lazarus was dead? 
Let's go on a little bit. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus was really uh, taking it hard that Lazarus had died. It says twice here that he groaned in the spirit. <coughs> so Lazarus was in a cave, a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then he took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. So Lazarus got the chance to live again. We can read further on in that chapter where Lazarus was eating with the people. But there's one question that I have. And, you know, maybe it's just not written up. But when we think about death, will we immediately be with God? Will we immediately be with Jesus? Or will we sleep? You would think there would be things written up in there where Lazarus was talking about everything that he had seen about the joys that he had experienced in heaven while he was there. We don't read that, and it's okay. Again, I'm not trying to stir something up or, or pit people against each other with their thoughts about this. And again, I wanted to just say, because I've heard this conversation so much lately, it don't matter. It just flat out doesn't matter. Just remember, we're gonna die, each one of us. And we need to be ready for that. And what happens after we take our last breath doesn't matter as long as we're ready. It doesn't matter when, how, where, or what. Let's go to Ecclesiastics uh, 9. It just don't matter. Be ready. Be ready to meet God. Nothing else really matters. Ecclesiastes 9, let's start at verse 2. No, verse 5. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. Nevermore will they have a share in anything done under the sun. Go eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart. Aaron was talking about joy, how we need joy in our life. God is talking about it too. Go eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with a merry heart. For God has already accepted your works. Let your garments always be white, and let your head lack no oil, like an ex-verse. Live joyfully with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life which he has given you. Under the sun, all your days of vanity, for that is your portion in life, and in the labor which you perform under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. But we don't want to think of death as the end, because it certainly isn't. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who dies shall live. Death is life. It's not death, it's life. <laughs> So why do we call it death? Well, yeah. Anyway, let's read uh, 1 Thessalonians. Come on. 
Got a worm in here, isn't it? <laughs> First Thessalonians, let's go to uh, chapter 4, verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, because this is Paul talking. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow, thank you, as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who sleep. What he's saying there is that even if we're alive when Jesus comes and others have died, died in Christ, we're not going to see Jesus come before they do. They're going to see it at the same time. For the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we will always be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. We will always be with the Lord. I made a lot of mistakes in my life, did a lot of stupid stuff, and uh, uh, yeah, I want to live a long time yet, but I want to, I, uh, I long for the day that I meet Jesus face to face. I really do. I long for that day. Can you just imagine walking into the gates of heaven or meeting him on the white horse? Taking his hand, giving him a hug, looking at the nails, the holes in his feet and his hands, realizing that you're going to be able to be with Christ forever and ever. Be able to sit along the River Jordan, underneath the beautiful trees, have a conversation with him. Sure, I believe, I believe that. 1 Thessalonians 4. Did I read that already? Mm -hmm. I did. <laughs> so. When we stop and think about what happened with Dad on Tuesday morning. <coughs> I know that God gave me the desire to speak those words. I know that it was He that put the desire in my heart. But suppose I wouldn't have listened. Suppose I wouldn't have spoke up. I can't really say, you know, for sure that He wouldn't have been going to be with Jesus anyway. But I can say that I know for sure that he is going to be with Jesus now. Why is it that so many times, and I'm sure that most of you have it better than I do, for me it's difficult to speak up sometimes. Why do we hate those of our family? Do we hate our friends? Do we hate our neighbors? the people that we're around, the people that we work with, do we hate them that much that we're not going to tell them about Jesus? We're just going to let them die in their sin. That certainly isn't a good thing to think about. But you know what? We all, we all need to get off of our duff. And we need to get out there. And we need to tell people about Jesus. And we need to do it without fear. We need to do it with the power and the authority that Jesus wants to give us to do these things. That's right. We need to go forth. We need to speak it. And we can't be afraid. Whether it's the foremost preacher in the Amish church or whether it's the most satanic person in the jungle. We can't be afraid. Why would we be if we believe that Jesus has sent us? And if Jesus wants us to go, why would we be afraid? Do we think that Jesus is going to send us on a journey like that and then have us killed? I don't think so. Hallelujah. Come on. Hey. So we jump on an airplane and we go over to India. 
we are in the jungles. I've actually been invited to come to India. I've been invited to go with a pastor and preach to the savages in the jungle that have never heard about Jesus. There are still jungles over there. There are still areas where there are natives that have never heard about Jesus. And I mean they live a godless life. They live a godless life. I've been asked to go over there, and I want to go. So far, God hasn't been in agreement because I need somebody to go along, and I need finances. And that hasn't happened yet. But I kind of feel like God spoke to me and told me to share that right now. I want to go to India. I want to go. I want to go in a jungle. I can't walk so good. I can't stand so good. I can't breathe so well, but I still want to go. I had a habit of, and I said this even before I was born again, but too many times I've said it after, where I said that I believe it would be easier to go out into the jungle and preach to the savages than it is to bring the word of God to the Amish people. And I believe God is laying this upon me to go see if this is true or to see what I can do with that. I want to go. I'm ready. Whenever God shows me the time is right. I'd like to go to Revelation 19. Hallelujah. Jesus. Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Jesus came down, left his home in heaven, hung on the cross so that you and I don't have to. He flat out took our place. We deserved to hang there. He didn't. But he was willing. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross for our sins, Lord. Thank you, Lord God, for all that you do for us, Lord God, and for all the things that you allow us to do, Lord, to bring forth your word. And Lord, I pray that you make us stronger. I pray for more authority and more understanding, more knowledge, Lord. I praise you. I glorify you. So, let's look a little bit about what's going to happen at the end of the world. If we go into Revelation chapter 19, let's start at verse 9. Then he said to me, this is uh, John, John, some people call him John the Revelator, but he was a John that was uh, thrown out on the Isle of Patmos, um, and God gave him revelations of what's going to happen in the end time, and that is what the book of Revelation is all about. It's not a book of revelations. It's a book of revelation. Singular. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Jesus, Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And who, he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clear, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I see that uh, we should probably stand up and sing a song because I think some of us are getting a little sleepy. On a hill called Calvary, Jesus smiled. Do you want to lead it down?
because he loved me. Let's take a notch down. Because he loved me, my Savior died on the cross, was crucified. No greater love than my mortal man has ever been known. Oh, praise his dear name, I love him so. I am his, is mine, I know. He suffered it all because he loved me. Because he loved me, my Savior died. On the cross was crucified. No greater love by mortal man has ever been known. Oh, praise his dear name, I love him so. I am his, he's mine, I know. He suffered it all because he loved me. Then they carried him away. show you who you should speak to. Maybe you should speak to somebody that night. Ask him. Ask him, who, who should I speak to? Who is the one that you want me to speak to? Of all the people in the world, who's the one that you most want me to speak to? Ask him that. Ask him that every morning this next week as you're in your prayer time. And see what happens. I'm interested to know. I have a feeling he would give most of you Perhaps all of you, a name of somebody that you should go speak to. Amen. And Amen. when he does, go. If you can go, go. Hallelujah. I have a lot more things that I wanted to share, but time is just moving on pretty fast. Uh, so I think I'm going to uh, give the space over. I guess Brother Jonas has a message yet. And uh, I... Yeah, praise the Lord. Praise All right, God. Yeah, that's yes. what I think.